You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and this individual right here is Jared Mount. How are we doing tonight? Doing well, doing well. We're excited to have uh, Travis Edens with us here uh, this evening, and uh, he's with Kingfisher Guide Service. And he's been a loyal patron here to Jake's Bait and Tackle for, for some time. And I always enjoy when he comes in because mm-hmm. I'm going to pick his brain and see how the river's fishing or, or see his posts and see what they're catching out of the river. And so we're excited to uh, hopefully gain some insight and knowledge from his expertise and experience spending a lot of time on the river, more than most. And so uh, my first question First question is, why Kingfisher, guy? Why did you name it Kingfisher? And then uh, just tell our listeners a little bit about uh, who you are. Yes, yeah, so uh, I chose Kingfisher because of um, many, many years ago, fishing out on the river with fly rod, mm-hmm. wade fishing in the summertime, and, you know, I'm missing fish. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, just not having a very good time of it. And here's this little bird. <laughs> the, the most punk rock of all birds out on the river with that mohawk, mohawk flying yeah. around and the one of the noises that they make almost sounds like in my mind you know like it's laughing mm-hmm. okay. and so this bird's flying around laughing at me you wow. know and so i took cool. that and decided to add it in you know for the name that's all awesome. so my, my mascot that's cool. They yeah. do frequent the Shenandoah River. Yeah, oh, man, there's tons of them out there. So, And then you started as a fly fisherman, actually? Yeah. I, I, well, That's crazy. Well, I mean, I, you know, of course, did conventional tackle yeah. uh, you know, early on and stuff. But I guess back in uh, the late 90s, I started fly fishing. Just picked up a fly rod from Kmart and um, brought it home and assembled it. Got a book. Uh, no word of a lie. I got a book called Fly Fishing for Dummies. <laughs> All right. And, uh, you know, it helped out and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, through trial and error and, you know, going out with some friends that fly fished, you know, you kind of begin to pick it all, you know, figure it out, you know, and that's in our form. uh, That's something I could not (laughs) not do. Then there's a point, man, where you get to like, it's like, there's a Zen moment where you're like, oh yeah, I see how this all works now. And Mm -hmm. once you get to that point, you're like, you're hooked. Yeah. You know? So. that's freaking cool yeah it's something i've always wanted to pick it, up with and it's not fishing. as hard as what i know if you've ever watched like river runs through it seemed to be the kind of movie yeah yeah, put it on the map. yeah but uh it looks hard but that you know shadow casting really in its simplest form you don't need to do all that and right. so it, it does uh i think in a lot of ways it can help you become a better fisherman um mm-hmm. and that's one thing too like here you, we talk we talk about a power fisherman versus finesse fisherman mm-hmm. but then you got the trout guys and mm-hmm. then you have the the fly rod guys, but when you can kind of bring all that together, it can make you, regardless of the type of fishing you're doing, it can make you a better angler. Yes. Oh, certainly. And it makes you, I think, uh, more observant mm-hmm. of what fish are feeding on or what they mm-hmm. could could feed on, you right. know, uh, you know, as far as that's concerned. Because especially when you're using, you know, feathers and hooks mm-hmm. tied together, yeah. or feathers and fur mm-hmm. tied together to make, you know, the, mm-hmm. the body of this of the lure you know um you know you want to you, sometimes you have to change it up a little bit especially when you're fishing a river and you're thinking about drifting and i'm just thinking about when i when i've watched like trout guys on tv that you you're thinking about the cast and how it drifts and the approach and how that correlates to using spinning tackle on yes. the river for whatever you're doing totally about how does that thing look and how it just drifts mm-hmm. by that that, yeah. that ambush yeah yeah, yeah and i've used like some of those uh fly tactics of drifting in spin cast. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially out on the river where you've got some current, you know, you mm-hmm. just, you know, you can, you can almost drift your lure, not even really give it much uh, action through reeling or jigging it or anything and let the current actually make a okay. bait, you know, especially wow. like a swim bait, you know, yeah, with that paddle tail and you just let the current take it and it'll, you get to a point at the end of the drift where it's like, you know, fish aren't going to eat it then, but you know, usually it's that final last little bit of the drift before it starts to be look unnatural mm. that it ends up getting eaten that's a great so. point now are you, you're native to this area you grew yeah. up fishing the shando yep. river yep grew up uh just north of winchester and uh uh so, you know start out fishing the uh, the opecken uh oh, cool. creek so uh i enjoy telling my kids uh because we live real close real close to the opecken creek 
but I enjoy telling my kids that they're the fourth generation to fish the Opeka Creek. That's, so that is really cool. Yeah, what yeah. were you targeting in the Opeka? What were you catching? Whatever was Whatever. biting. <laughs> <laughs> So, fall fish, I think, at the time that there was, there's still fall. I think fall yeah, fish yeah, yeah. Those, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you get them sometimes, uh, mm-hmm. especially in West Virginia where they stock. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get that fall fish bite, you know, and you're like, oh, it's a trout. Yeah. No, well, it's a fall fish. There, though, too. I, think, I don't yeah. know if they come up from West Virginia or come down from Isaac Walton. I'm not sure, but yeah. I grew up on the pecking as well, and, and there would be some holdover trout in there mm-hmm. as well. And yeah. some bass, I think. Yeah, yeah. And there's well. lot, lots of cold springs that mm-hmm. pour into that, mm-hmm. you know, creek. You know, any of the creeks, you know, because we're in a karst area, creeks and rivers, get a lot of, gotcha. you know, spring-fed, mm-hmm. uh, you know, where trout can could could hold survive. through the summer. Yeah. You know, I've caught, point. I've caught trout on the North Fork, uh, you know, yeah. and just hanging out in the spring in the middle of the summer. Yeah. Do you guide for trout or are trout something that are prevalent on the river systems around here? You know, I used to, they are not prevalent, um, but I used to do some wade guiding trips uh, for them. But since I've kind of gotten away from that, I'm more after the small mouth. Okay. So how much has the river changed? Um, I know we're talking about this a little bit before, before we started recording, but how much has the river in Shenandoah changed? Cause if you think about a river and a lake, you know, I think of a river is, is more robust. It changes a lot more constantly and sometimes it stays mm-hmm. the same, but how, how has the, the fishing changed over the years? Cause I remember when I was younger, the lesions on the small mouth yeah. mm-hmm. and like, where would you think the, the river is now compared to the past? I think we're kind of like, I think we're at like a middle ground right now. So it's not bad. It's not the greatest that it has been, and I do believe that it is cyclical. Okay. So that it will, we're we're on an upward trend, um, you know, as far as you know the 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 amount of fish mm-hmm. uh, and the size of fish. I mean, it's you know I'm not gonna knock on wood because I'm a superstitious person, <laughs> but uh, you know we're not finding lesions on fish. Yeah. Uh, you know, and if you do, you know, it's far and few between. So um, as a guy, like what was the worst, what was the darkest days or years for the Shenandoah you think when you were guiding? Uh, you know, I would really have to say, um, probably like 2018 into 2019 with the, uh, high water events that we had. Okay. Um, uh, I honestly, as a guide, I'd learned a lot about fishing dirty water and higher than normal water. Hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, that was in my mind, you know, like a down, a down point. Um, did that like affect the spawning habitat too? Oh, with that? certainly. Just, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. And that, that's kind of been an issue that we've had in the Shenandoah Valley with the Shenandoah and Potomac is that, uh, we end up with floods or high water events right at, uh, uh, spawn mm-hmm. or post spawn, which will, you know, that year class of fish is can be totally gone yeah. you know non-existent and that's a ripple effect that it's not just that year but it's years to come yes. before you really feel that where you lose that, yes. that class of fish. exactly exactly um, which yeah uh, yeah so take us from uh growing up fishing the the pecking yeah fly fishing to what led you into guiding guiding or so, prior to up to guiding so guiding um you know with the fly fishing um <clears throat> passion i I eventually uh, got into where I wanted to, I wanted a fishing raft, right? You know, one decked out with a frame and stuff that you row. And uh, I come from a whitewater background, canoeing, stuff mm-hmm. like that, kayaking. Um, was a was a river guide, you know, for uh, one of the outfitters up there at Harper's Ferry. Uh, and so eventually, you know, it was like, I need a boat. And a boat that is not, you know, a hard-bodied boat, something that I can get through some stuff that, mm-hmm. you know, is a little bit chunkier, rocky, uh, stuff that you probably wouldn't take a harder boat yeah. through. And settled on a fishing raft, purchased it, got it in like, it was like January, uh, brought it inside the house and inflated it. You know? <laughs> like a kid on Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. Uh, my, my young son, you know, he was, you know, he was ecstatic. I mean, he was probably like three years old, four years old, something like that when I got it. And so it was like a big bouncy, uh, inflatable inside the house for him. Uh, but so the, the boat came first. Mm -hmm. All right. And I had it. Were you at this time? Um, I would have been 30, 34, 35, something like that. So, uh, in my, in the back of my head, I had this idea that I wanted to become a guide. Mm -hmm. 
at some point, you know, thought it would be, you know, a pretty cool thing to do. And um, so then, you know, had the boat, was already taking friends and family out, eventually ended up uh, with when the recession hit. Um, I lost probably close to a third of my pay uh, because I was in um, retail. And so, you know, bonuses, you know, if the sales aren't there, you know, you're not getting the bonuses. So um, lost close to a third of my pay and decided that I needed to recoup that somehow. And I, at the time I was living up in Harpers Ferry and I thought, opportunity. What, yeah, what do we have at Harpers Ferry? Well, there's no industry really other than tourism. Mm-hmm. And so decided to go the tourism route and start guiding. Hmm. That's awesome. So, and here I am. Here you are. <laughs> <laughs> and so then w- when you're guiding, what, what kind of rules and regulations do you have to like, cause it, I, I always think like a charter as in you're in the Florida Keys on this big boat. Like, I mean, are you under those same guidelines when you have to get into to, to guiding or is it different with a raft that we um, have to go through? It's, it's a little different. Like, you know, if I did have a, um, you know, the charter license, like a six pack license, uh, folks would not have to have a fishing license, uh, when they were on the boat with me. Uh, but you know, I can go on that, go on that route, you know, the logistics behind that, you know, the time and, you know, the money that comes into getting that particular license would be just, you know, I don't, um, you don't have to deal with it. Yeah. yeah, Which is awesome. I don't have to deal with it. So, so, uh, um, you know, with, uh, guiding and stuff like that you know of course you have to have liability insurance uh and in some states you have to have a guide license like west virginia maryland uh virginia you do do not have to have one uh but liability insurance you know like i said and um you have to be comfortable with strangers Mm -hmm. uh you know i mean people every day that you know some of them i may never never see again uh some of them i'll see multiple times afterwards but Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, you got to be a customer service oriented, you know, yeah, tying, <laughs> tying hooks on. Because you uh, can't get away from them in the no, hour day. No, you're no, there. No, 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 you know, and, I mean, honestly, sometimes, you know, the boat ramp just doesn't get there fast <laughs> enough. So. <laughs> so so then like when when you're planning out and let's say this time of year from October to, to, to February, let's say. Um, are you, are you primarily just the Shenandoah or because the upper Potomac's right there and then you have where they both converge? I mean, do you, do you guide on all three of those different ones or are you specifically focus on one? You know, I used to guide on all three, um, uh, but I've kind of strayed away from that. Uh, and that was due to part in part due to the, uh, high water events. Okay. Excuse me. We had, um, back in 2018, well, and over multiple years, uh, like the upper Potomac. Potomac doesn't fish quite as well as what it used to. We don't have get the numbers in. Big fish are still there, uh, but we don't quite get the numbers in that we used to. Same way with the you you could probably, you know call it the Upper Shenandoah uh, or lower end actually lower end of Shenandoah. You know mm-hmm. down where the whitewater stretches and stuff like that uh, has seen the same issue. Um, as far as numbers and I, and I think what he means if there's from like harper's ferry all the way up until which would be like seven would be that kind of area you're talking about uh, no no particularly below the millville dam oh millville dam okay yeah so millville dam down uh that shenandoah section okay uh, which comes into the confluence there at harper's ferry um again just doesn't fish quite as well as it it used to um so i've moved a lot of the operation more to to the virginia sections main stem of the shenandoah um you know with doing some north fork uh trips as well and south fork okay but primarily main stem what's your favorite section of all that you've done uh <laughs> or does yeah. it change depending on the i mean years? it does it does change depending on the the time uh you know time of the year i like uh you know mostly you know like right around the route 50, you know, above and down, uh, you know, if you go too far upstream, you know, you get to like, you know, Egypt bend and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's deeper water and it has, uh, it's moments, but, um, are you going 50 to uh, locks or are you going to do 50 to 70? 50 to locks. locks. Yeah. 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 You you don't want to do 50 to route. That's a long stretch. stretch. And that's the one thing. How do you gauge that? Because I remember the one time, God love her, she still stayed with me, my fiance at the time. I was like, you know what? We're going to float from the Seven Bridge 
all the way down to just before Harper's Ferry. Because if you look at a map from very far away, it's like, that's four hours. That's yeah. no problem. Yeah. Cut to it was 11 o'clock at night and she's crying. Yeah. We're still out there. Right. How the hell do you gauge a trip to where it's like, because you have to, because it's an AR trip. Like, is it because you've done it so many times? Or can you look at a map and be like, yep, this is how fast we're going to float it? You know, honestly, what I do a lot is uh, check a map. Uh, I've got like, it's called like Map My Run. App. oh really okay and you can it's got it's topographical you know google maps and you just kind of scan in find what section you're looking to float and you just drop pins and you can measure it that okay the interesting. distance you know yeah. and some of it's been trial and error uh, mm -hmm. you know back in the day i mean me and my buddies decided we were going to float from 50 to route seven <laughs> and, you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> by lunchtime all the beer was gone and, <laughs> <laughs> no, and we didn't want to, you know, no have the food. corner of our man card ripped off, you <laughs> yeah. know, because then stop and ask somebody for help. So, oh my god, yeah. So can... generally, that fifty to locks and then locks to route seven is is generally those are two floats mm -hmm. on the main stem that in this area that are, are pretty good. Too. Yes, um, yes, very good, yeah. very good. How do you and I? We I think we we touched on this earlier, but you know, I I being a Loudoun County boy at heart and seeing the growth there, and let's say you're going to do a summertime trip, does mm -hmm. that affect it with Watermelon Park and that you'll have six billion guys with coolers floating? Do you adjust your float trips in the summertime, knowing about the I don't float traffic? I guess you'd call it like like on the river. No, or, or does it affect the fish at all? Uh, I mean, it'll affect the fish to a certain extent, uh, but like up around Harper's Ferry. I mean, those guys, you know, the outfitters up around there, their busiest weekend, they'll put 2,000 people on the river in a day. Wow. wow. Oh that my God. All right. <laughs> so, I mean, I've caught, you know, when I would fish that section a lot. <laughs> I mean, I would, uh, you would catch, we call it a tuber hatch, you know, and uh, it looked like, you know, uh, Fruit Loops floating down the river because they have different colored tubes. <laughs> <laughs> But we, that's a you, lot of people. That's a it lot is. Of people. Well, and, and there's three outfitters. I didn't know that. Okay. So, I mean, you figure three outfitters. I mean, that's, that's a lot. That's potentially 6,000 mm -hmm. folks, you know, in, in a very small yeah. area, you know. And the South Fork tends to see more, too, with Downriver Canoe Company, Front Royal Canoe Company. Yeah. So definitely, you're right. In the summertime, it, you kind of have to look at that. And... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, how, but how, yeah, but you, you know, as that? far as yeah. the fishing, uh, you know, generally, I I don't think it really affects the fish that much. I mean, you just don't fish close to mm -hmm. them. I mean, you get those guys that end up, you know, you're obviously fishing. Everybody's fishing off the boat in a certain direction, and you get that one, two, three tubers that come floating down through your area. You know, but most people are very observant. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, if you've ever been at, yelled at by an angler on the river, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll think twice <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah because i was just thinking about that because i remember one time i was in a, a buddy's jet boat and we come barreling around the corner and all of a sudden it's like oh my god yeah and i just like thought from if, if you're making your living doing this it's like is that because like the tva system or a title chart you can look and say like okay this is when things are going to happen but yeah in the summertime you can't really set your watch to if you have this this person that you have to put on fish and you mm -hmm. turn the corner and there's six billion tubes yeah like, that's something that you, it's almost out of your control. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. Like if I see like a big mass of <clears throat> folks coming down the river, I'm going to mm -hmm. do one of two things. I'm going to stay ahead of them. Okay. Or I'll let them pass by and let them get way by and then, you know, kind of pick back up, you know, sometimes it's a good time to stop break for lunch. Okay. So, but then, so the fish, it doesn't take long. Cause that's the one thing I was shocked. I would be shocked by is like, it doesn't bother them to have yeah. all that commotion. Cause yeah. I would think like that would shut down an area yeah, for a while. Maybe they just get used to it after a while. Now, so. do you adjust uh, from your summer? Is one float basically good depending on the time of year? Or is it basically, I can just basically do one float with my son and this float I can, you know, there's a good shot I can get on fish, or does mm -hmm. it really change depending on, on the time of year? Uh, it, it does change some depending on the time of the year as to smallmouth movement. Okay. So, uh, for for example, like right now, you know, we're kind of in that transition from fall to winter. And so um, you're still going to find some fish in transition. So they're heading to deeper holes for the winter time, and that's where they're going to settle up. Uh, you're going to find fish in that deeper hole. But you can't discredit that some of that shallower water, and some of it's dependent on uh, water levels as well. But uh, yeah, so I mean, you can still find fish. So I will, you know, if I'm going to do a winter float, 
I might float a whole totally different uh, stretch. Okay. And uh, usually, I you know, depending on the water levels, uh, I probably won't even bother beating any of the water until I get to that deeper spot. You always felt the, the fall, although it's a great time of year to fish. When you're talking about transition, it can be mm -hmm. hard to find them too because mm -hmm. be, once they get to that wintering hole, then you kind of pinpoint that. But yeah. you know, coming out of the shallows, going to the deep, and where they're at in that. Yeah. What, what have you found? Is it water temperature, or what? What seems to be the determining factor when you're in that transition? Is there anything yeah. you've been able to drill down and say that? Definitely you know, water temperature. Mm -hmm. You know, water temperature, and I and I they they can sense that you know the days are getting shorter and the nights are getting longer. So uh, you know they may, they start making that making their way. Um, you were, uh, wanted to touch on a point that you uh, kind of mentioned on, or was going to make a point to what you were talking about, and that was. Um, I had a trip on Wednesday and Thursday, and my Wednesday guys, all right, were fishing in a summer mind frame. Okay. Mm. So, so they're fishing, you know, below, you know, in riffles and stuff like that. It's like, you know, they're probably not in there. Not yeah, there. yeah. So now, if, if you don't have, if you have a kayak or you know a float tube, and you don't have ten billion dollars of electronics. Are you basically deciding that this is the deep pool with your eyes, or do you have electronics on with your, your tube? No, okay. no electronics. What are you looking for then, visually? If, if you want to say like this is a place I should try to mm -hmm. cast, just uh, you know, usually eddies. Okay. Uh, or you know, you, for example, you might have a, a a pour over, you know, a small ledge or something like that. Uh, the downstream, if it's deep enough. And you can't see the bottom. You get that kind of gray green colored water. Okay. Um, you know, that's a good chance that there's going to be some fish there. Okay. So and that is really definitely. I know Neil was talking too. That learning to read the water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do that as a trout fisherman or a creek or whatever. But just yeah. reading that water, sometimes watching bubbles or watching a stick come down or watching mm -hmm. how it hits that rock and in an eddy case, how it comes yeah. back and works upriver, and you got that slack water in there on the river. I mean, that is being able to read the water what that current is doing and where mm -hmm. those fish are staging i think yeah is, is if yeah. you don't know that mm -hmm. then that's something you need to research yeah. and learn and watch and and, and, kind of, and that's where fly fishing comes in. can come yeah, okay. to come into yeah. play because mm -hmm. you know part and especially like if you're like fly fishing for trout mm -hmm. you're like you you know you're on the small stream little creek something like that you know you're hitting the, the seams, you know, which is the line between the eddy and the fast moving water and stuff. I mean, and then you just translate that into a bigger, you know, river and, and, um, yeah. You know, and and that's where time out. on the water guys comes really into play for this. Cause like, again, not to bash on Bassmasters again, but like you read about stuff and like you follow your electronics and that stuff can be a quickly learned skill. But when you're reading a river or if you're having a jet boat and you're learning how to run it or, or whatever, yeah, right. it, it's something that just you can't learn that quickly. Mm -hmm. It's time. It's to yeah. get out there with a guide that knows the water, mm -hmm. learn it. So first you can be safe. I mean, that's the thing is if you're on a river, especially when it's a little bit colder out, you don't want to have a, a situation where you're flipping over or something like that. If you yeah. don't know what sections are dangerous and what sections aren't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just smiling because I used to teach uh, outdoor education in, in, in high school and we would take them. I mean, we'd put we go through Downriver Canoe Company and rent the canoes and yeah. but I would go over the basics you know the paddling techniques mm -hmm. for the front and the back and, the, mm -hmm. and, and just basic techniques to help them out and and uh, which side you know if you want to turn or whatever and and then reading the water the downward v's and you know what you yeah. do when you're going through the rapids and stuff and it was always interesting because you would try to show them you try to teach it but until you get on the water yep. you get on the water with I don't know it might be 30 boats 30 canoes and they're doing you know 360 <laughs> down through there going sideways and everything else you know and so Anyway, but you're right. You got to be able to fly those principles too. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it's yeah. So then, fly fishing. I'm really loving this. Like, mm -hmm. what are the best times to do to fly fish the river? Because I'm thinking like a deep pool and fly fishing. My brain doesn't wrap around that. Is the best yeah, time? Yeah. 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 Definitely. Uh, I would say, you know, you know, your better months. Um, you know, late April through, um, you know, early October, uh, are good to you know get out with the fly rod um and the, you know big thing is is that if you're wade fishing mm -hmm. mm. that can be you, you've got to be careful out on the water i mean you know there you, you could bash your shins to, one slip uh, yeah you know there's all kinds of you know possibilities of of bad things that could happen um but from a you know boat aspect you know you can extend that 
you know, your success rate, mm -hmm. uh, even better, you know, to be able to get out there. But, you know, generally those nicer months uh, are really good. You could get them in the wintertime. You just would really need to know where to get them yeah. at and uh, what to throw at them and to have the right equipment to do it, you know. So you're not going to have, you know, through the, the nicer months, you're going to have a floating line. Uh, that literally sits on top of the water. Okay. Uh, whereas in the wintertime, you're going down low and deep uh, to fish for them. So you have to have a sinking line and a you know a heavy uh, fly, something weighted. Well, you recently had a with the whole cicada. I remember seeing Ooh, your man. come across now that. A lot of that yeah. was probably fly rod, correct? That was and, a lot of fly rod. Uh, he was, <clears throat> you go on his, his Instagram page and you'll see some huge monsters. Monster. monster I call it carpocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> myself <laughs> yeah, so talk about that a little bit that doesn't happen yeah anymore. yeah no that's a once in 17 year event right there uh you took advantage of i it. took complete advantage <laughs> of it so uh and i had guys out that had never picked up a fly rod before mm -hmm. so tie uh, a cicada pattern on there shuck a bunch of line out get get them to just a basic you know lob cast almost uh you know maybe get them to do a little bit of false casting mm -hmm. and uh yeah we came up with uh some very very successful days but yes it was a lot of fly fishing and carp amazing i mean you don't realize how many carp you have mm -hmm. in your waterway until you have a brood 10 wow. cicada hatch because they're all over up against the banks and sipping cicadas off the surface That's just crazy. like trout sipping flies off the surface you know you say that what you said the sipping i, I can remember this has been many moons ago when i was canoeing the river and i was going from we put it in warner's bottom we had permission yep. on a private uh, mm -hmm. landowner and i like that stretch because and, mm -hmm. and i think they call it hawkins ledge I, I don't know if it's ever been officially named but yeah right above hawkins ledge um used to be one of my and, and when you're coming up from locks there was only one chute right there, and if the water wasn't right, you didn't have the right boat, you weren't going to get you were done. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. It wasn't heavily fished, but at any rate, I can remember two different, two different trips where the first one down on spinning tackle, and I threw threw the rappella floating minnow. Mm -hmm. It was on the top. It was in the summertime, and you know, twitch, twitch, and that bass just smallmouth just you know crushed it. I mean, yeah. it was probably three three pounder, three and a half pounder. Yeah. But great fight, you know. And I oh, came yeah. back maybe one or two trips later later in the summer and i brought the fly rod we'd always tie these we called them deer hair bugs mm -hmm. that's what we had the deer hair but it was similar to an elk hair caddis basically and like yeah. you're saying and you just flip it out there well it was the same scene when you were talking about before i caught the other one i thought you know it's been there before so floated down there and it was a totally i believe it was the same fish no way of knowing about the same size yeah. uh but where the first one it just i mean it just hammered it this one it did it literally that bass literally just sit, and sit I guess that right they, off the because surface. Because of the fly, they know too. They don't. Make, yeah. Not saying they won't attack. Yes. But it's a totally different bite. Yeah. Yeah. Same yeah. fish. Two different, you know, presentations. Yeah. Two different experiences. Yeah. I mean, it was it was kind of cool. Yeah. 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 So cre creeping on your Facebook profile right now, like these carp are freaking massive. <laughs> and, and it, <laughs> I've seen some specials where people are specifically, I think what they call it like LA sewer trout. Like yeah, they're, the, yeah. they're, they're actually fly fishing for them. It's, yeah. it, what are your thoughts, I guess, on them? Is it something you can only target on the river when the cicada hatch happens? And if, if not, like, are they actually a good sports fish to actually catch? They're, they're actually a great sport fish. They're kind of a white whale for some fly guys. Really? And they were for me for a while. And then, you know, back, uh, I guess, early 2000s i picked up a book called like you know carp fly, or fishing for carp on the fly or something like that huh. uh it was kind of a, it was a um, a real uh, uh you know some kind of voodoo or something like that uh something very unknown to me that i wanted to learn because i you know if if you've done any fishing around here i mean you know we've got common carp in all the oh, waters yeah. uh around here and they were from what i understand a um uh, brought in as a food fish since they're not native to here because hmm. they can live literally anywhere hmm. in any kind of water uh lakes ponds creeks rivers you name it and they get big too right yeah but, yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and they do get big and so uh so you can target them uh other than th during the cicada hatch and you've just got to get sometimes it's the moon and the stars have to be aligned just in the right way, you know, for you to get, uh, you know, uh, a shot at them, but you catch one. I mean, it's just, 
you hang on is what it is with fly rod i mean you know it's you know any fish that takes you to the backing on a fly rod Oof, that's fun is oh my you know is 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 a is a uh, admirable fish so is so. it a treat when you catch one or are there like seasonal patterns that you can reliably like if a person says hey i want to go out and catch a, a, a carp on a mm -hmm. fly rod is that something that that you can do or is that more of like ah it's everything's yeah. got to be just right yeah no no i mean we can definitely uh target them you know you've you know sometimes these carp are uh will show up in areas kind of like clockwork really yeah you can set it almost set your watch to it and that was like that was the learning experience that i had with my first carp on the fly and really specifically trying to target them i mean i'd go out and smallmouth bass fish and this is the same area where you know the kingfisher was flying around laughing at me uh, <laughs> but i'm out there and you know these these carp i Every time I was out there, same time every day, here come these carp, you know, That's a pack crazy. of them feeding. And so, you know, you just kind of watch and, uh, you know, I'm trying to get ready to, you know, I, I'm fishing something for smallies, you know, maybe a popper or something like that, top water. And I, I, I see these carp coming up and I'm like, whoa, you know, like, what's, you know, got to, where's that fly, you know, that, that I'm going to tie on that I specifically wanted to target the the uh, carp with and i'm trying to tie it on and i'm dropping flies all over the place you know and you know my knot's not even the best <laughs> knot you know and i'm you know finally i just get it on there and i go to make my cast and the carp are spooked and gone gonna, like so, they're spooky right yeah, like compared super spooky. to a small mouth it's yeah, more spooky yeah, yeah so if you see one like like talk to everyone about like the approach because i think this is something like i've heard about people fly fishing for carp before but i've never gotten a chance yeah. to talk like this it, is something people don't do well it's kind of like it's almost like um deer hunting okay you know deer hunting you go sit in a tree stand and you let that let that buck you know come into you or come within range you know for you to be able to get it and it's kind of the same way with carp you know you you can go up and set and just wait and uh you know if it's an area that you've been observing observing for a while and you know that they're going to move through there at some point in time um you know good time to you know just set and wait okay um but yeah it's uh i mean it's a challenge mm -hmm. uh but it is you know when you do hook up, I mean, the payoff is, oh, yeah. you know, super exciting. Oh, uh, I wish I was there for the love of yeah. That would have been amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things. It was, it was amazing. And it was amazing to watch those carp because eventually within the first like week, they ate every cicada that fell off of it, yeah. fell out, fell into the water. Within a week or two, they were selective. Interesting. And they were smart enough that they can, they could see, so a male cicada their body's a bit hollow because they're the ones that make the noise uh you know the mating call whatever you want to call it and so they ride higher in the water film than what a female does which has the eggs and the ovipositor and all that stuff and so they ride lower in the water film and you would see a carp come up to obviously a male cicada that's riding higher turn around, turn around it and catch the male that or the female that was yeah, behind wow. it that's wild. That is really <laughs> crazy, and that's a time I'm, like that is freaking yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah, but I mean that's observation, you know, and yeah, that's where fly fishing, yeah. you know, like I said, you know, it you observe, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you match the hatch, you know, you kick rocks over and see what's you know on the bottom, or you know, if, if you're catching smallies, uh, sometimes when you hook a smallie, and what's it do? It pukes up what it's got in its stomach you know and you can get a good idea sometimes as to you know what they've been feeding on so let's talk about smallies a little bit because i'd imagine that i know that's the predominant yeah. uh, in this area uh, mm -hmm. small mouth bass oh and, yeah and rightly so because i mean i pound for pound those things are fighters i mean yeah. they jump out of the water i mean you just cannot beat you know healthy small mouth on yeah. the river with the current and right so you've had a lot of experience with that um, you don't have to divulge all your deep secrets, but, mm -hmm. but I would imagine too, you're being a guide, your bread and butter is getting, having people have success and putting people in the right place and throwing the right things. And so, yeah. you know, a thing or two about catching the small mouth, um, what would you be willing to share with our, our listeners mm -hmm. about your success or what you think is takes yeah. to be successful in the river? Yeah. I, I honest, honestly, success comes from it's, it's boils down to time mm -hmm. you know you spend a lot of time i mean you can go out there and, and fish and catch a big fish you know uh 
you know, without even really doing any research, mm -hmm. uh, which you know that that's luck uh, is mm -hmm. what that is. But you yeah, know, it is. It, you know, time spent out on the water. I mean, I spend a ton of time out there. Um, you know, even when I'm not guiding, you know, I got to get out there and fish sometime for myself, right? You know, I mean, you can't just, you know, you can't catch them from the couch. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, as far as like that is concerned, time. Uh, and then switching up, you know, your baits, you know, and kind of knowing what season, you know, what time of the year, uh, you know, you get, you know, you get a little bit of time uh, and grade out on the water and you can start to figure out. And, you know, again, it's like I was talking about the transitioning smallmouth this time of the year, uh, and, you know, being in deep holes and stuff like that. You start to pick up on, you know, where the fish are and what they're going to what they're going to eat. Um, you know, said, uh, switch, I, I struggle with that. When when do you how do you determine when to switch? baits let's say yeah or locations like is there a rule of thumb you use to say you know what this isn't working i need to switch it up yeah and you know well uh, let me give you an example this uh this past summer there was a point in time in august and man when it was you know hot as blazes out um you know my normal baits that i would throw that time of year like a like a paddle tail swim bait something like that uh was not getting it getting the job done mm -hmm. and I, it dawned on me. I was like, you know what? I was like, let's go back to basics. Hmm. And so I went back to throwing just a simple, like three inch grub <laughs> on an eighth ounce. Last time you heard about grub being Mr. Fish. Twister. Oh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh man. And, and, and it, and it made all the difference. I mean, it really made all the difference. It, like the fish were willing to eat that but they wouldn't eat the normal swim bait that I would throw for them that time of year. And so, you know, yeah, yeah. I, you know, it just kind of dawned on me one day when we were out there and I told my, told my customers, I said, all right, we're going old school guys. And mm -hmm. uh, we went old school and it paid off. So wow. that is pretty cool. yeah. And that was yeah. like in the hot doldrums of summer, you know, when the water was low and, and uh, you know, the sun was just beating down on you and sunburned city. So yeah. And you mentioned before in passing the the, the, the cicadas, mm -hmm. turning over rocks and looking. When you're talking about the, the river ecosystem, there are seasonal forages that, that the smallmouth and the predators really look for. Um, if you could divulge in that a little bit, like I remember the helgramite yeah. is a big thing. Yeah. But then you think about maybe the helgramite is not a seasonal thing. So right. from spring, summer to fall, what are the key forages that, that, that really change the fish, barring some like brood X thing? Like what, yeah, what yeah, makes the change? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, um, uh, you know, so bait fish, they, they'll die off in the winter. All right, and so there's fewer of them through the winter seasons. So generally, you know, that's probably not the best imitation to the row, you know, some kind of bait fish uh, imitation, like, for you know, the, for example, in the winter. Uh, the one other thing, like a helgramite, you know, which, you know, you can fish those all year round, um, crayfish, okay. you know. I mean, tons and tons of crayfish in the river. And if you've ever caught, like I said, when, you know, when that, when that smaller you catch that smaller and it you know pukes up its lunch mm -hmm. uh you're probably going to see some crayfish bits floating around uh in the mix are, are crayfish a, a seasonal thing as well or is it is it always good is there better times That's of the year a, they're a year round okay. they're a year they're in there year round so they say they would burrow at a certain temperature but yeah i don't think you know it, i don't think it's cold enough here and the other thing i always thought is they're not the fish is not gonna even if they did let's say they you know, kind of burrowed and yeah. weren't as accessible to the fish. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure one mm -hmm. scurries by a smallmouth, it's not going to be like, you're not yeah, supposed to be yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think yeah. I have heard on some bodies of water if it gets too cold, but like yeah. you're saying it doesn't apply because the yeah. fish, it's, yeah. you can always throw that. I've, I've seen monster crayfish, you know, like that long, you know, like mm -hmm. five, six inches long in the wintertime. Right. Mm-hmm. On the bottom, you know, on the bottom, you know, a lot of time is in the shallows, you know, I'm assuming they're probably warming up a little bit, you know, um, you know, in that shallower water, a little bit more active, you know. Yeah. Are there different types of bait or, or like, so example is like we talked about earlier, like the shad or a big thing or elf life. What type of bait fish do they, I've never even thought about that. Like, are there bait fish they actually do target when they're not targeting crayfish uh, that, that would be Shenandoah considered bait fish? Uh, you know, I mean, shiners, I mean, you know, shiners on yeah, I really? think we've got shiners okay. or something along those lines. <clears throat> uh, I mean, mad toms, mad toms are huge. 
you know. Really? Yeah, yeah, Cause yeah. I'm thinking yeah. like when I'm fishing a swim bait on the Shenandoah, it's like, what the heck am I trying to imitate here? Because it's not a shack. Well, like, sometimes what are they trying to eat. I mean, I mean, they're cannibals too. Well, so they're oh. dog eat dog so okay. yeah, yeah, they'll they'll eat yeah. they'll eat other smallies. So um, post smallmouth spawn, they're thinking that they're they're hunting down the brood of the year. They type could of thing. very well, okay. yes, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's um, you know, I'm just trying to think. So the Mad Toms, all right. I um, <laughs> are you? That's huge. Yeah, are you not familiar with Mad Toms? No, I'm not. Oh, man. <laughs> Dude, it's like a little baby or a little miniature catfish. Really? Yeah, yeah. and they have spurs on them, on their on their um, uh, pectoral fins that actually have a, it's a bit of a toxin in them. Um, oh, wow. Damn yeah, damn if you it. handle them too much, you know, you can, you can, you know, your hand might become numb or something Seriously? like that. Yeah, they're really interesting little it's amazing critters. They sell some, but there's not too many manufacturers no. that are making a mad tom, and which right. is for the river is, like you said, the helger mite. A lot mm -hmm. of people know the helger mite. Yeah. But the mad tom, it's yeah. a small amount a, of A good friend of mine did, uh, mm -hmm. was with the Shenandoah River Keepers, okay. um, and he did some studies with, you know, some of the scientists, the biologists, uh, and so the, some of these, uh, smallmouth that they had harvested to dissect and, you know, kind of figure out what makes them tick and, you know, measure, you know, tissue samples and stuff like that, you know, see if they've got any toxins in them. They found that these fish had prick marks hmm. Hmm. down their gullets all the way to their stomachs and in their stomachs. Is that right? And it was from mad toms. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, even though you know, like it probably stings them up, numbs them up, yeah. whatever you know. But boy, they see those mad toms. You and know, they talk about like you hear like the smallmouth too. Their noses you see on top bridge of their thing where, and it could be a crayfish too. Crayfish it could be anything. Mm, yeah, trying to get away under that rock. But yes, when they're onto them, man. They'll get down yeah, just, yeah, know, scar their nose up. You know, so that, and that's really interesting. So like the the smallmouth on on the river system around here are not looking at pelagic species. Like we were talking about the L wife in like the um lake holiday and lake frederick mm -hmm. where they're looking up and they're chasing and ambushing where if you think of the smallmouth on this river system they're down there looking down most of the time mm -hmm. right, and, right. and they're feeding around there which yeah. is yeah wow i didn't even know this thing existed that's crazy i would think your bigger ones tend, <clears throat> i always felt the bigger ones tend to stay to the bottom mm -hmm. i mean you might get you know them come up hit a top water or something certain times of year but yeah predominantly i think I always felt the bottom yeah. was where you're going to. Yeah. No, I have another question. Sorry. Like, this is like to actually have you here. I was, when I was a kid, I would kayak. I remember I was kayaking the river and there were all these little bugs on the river and you could just see the bluegill stuff would like start sucking them in. And I, I threw a little trout magnet and all of a sudden I hooked like a three pound smallmouth <laughs> after these things. But I was like, what are these bugs and do the small why would a smallmouth feed on something like that small or, or are they attract like what's going on there yeah, e yeah. ecosystem wise uh you know i as far as like hatches and stuff on the river uh i mean is that what you're referring yeah, to yeah, is yeah. like a hatch of something yeah. you know something small there's tons of different uh you know uh, bugs that hatch on a river i mean really? back in the day like the white fly uh was you know was super huge you know as far as i mean we'd have some monster you know hatches of these bugs but it's hard to tell exactly what uh you know that might be i mean uh, you know a lot of folks you know see those like water skippers and stuff yeah. on the river but you know like the fish just don't smash those things up uh and for what reason i'm not really sure why they don't eat those um but you know what um what maybe they uh and you said it was like a three pound you know, but like it, small mouth it, or it, decent it, size it was small just a mouth. One, it was just yeah. so weird. Like the bugs, are, there was like a ton. It was late summer, and there was like a ton of bugs on the water. Yeah. And all of a sudden, like the top water bite started happening. And yeah. It's so crazy. It's like, are these hatches something that you key in on when you see them happening? And do the small mouth change their feeding behavior based on well, hatches? I mean, and some of it could make them change their okay. feeding habit because of the fact that maybe there's something else that's feeding on oh. smaller feeding on that okay. insect. Oh, uh, you know, that's, ha that's you know, hatching on the river or landing on the water, and, and maybe they were after that, you know. That's, okay, you that's crazy, yeah. What, the entomology, I guess, and the, if you think about yeah. the hatch and the streamer nymph stage, so, like, we, we think of them on the, on the surface, but by the time, even the helger mite, I mean, when it's under that rock and in fall, it used to be, I remember we were going to Shepherd, we would go up to Dan 4 mm -hmm. and wait, and we would just literally, you know, you'd take the rocks and take the helger mites off. And Hook them, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, but anyway, so that from that to the it gets its wings and flies. But anywhere in that, as it 
makes its way to the surface. Yeah. I got to think too. I mean, fish are going to, they, I don't want to say they're going to eat pounds of that, but right. it's there. They'll eat mm-hmm. it. Too. I mean, That's, like it's, it's so small mouth too though. I mean, they're not, it's not a trout. So like, you know, you could, mm-hmm. you could have a 22 inch trout mm-hmm. and if you examined its gut, you know, you would find, you know, thousands of these small bugs you know that they've been sipping off the surface you know that's crazy and in part you know that's because Mm -hmm. trout have a much smaller mouth than what a small mouth bass does Mm -hmm. whereas a small mouth you know i think typically tend to you know they like some bigger Mm -hmm. you know bigger bigger meals uh you know and that's why like if you go out you know you just don't see a lot of small mouth hammering Mm -hmm. those hatches interesting uh, that are okay. coming off the water you know you'll find a lot of the smaller guys you know and they make you know the little ripples and stuff you know on the water but the bigger ones you know generally they like something a little bit meatier you know and that's a little bit more substantial big for the people at home because they tell you you know fish a big ass wake bait or a walking bait for the small mouth but if you think if you're gonna go fish the shenandoah like a lot of that that conventional wisdom just leave it home right? mm-hmm. like and stick with the bow the bottom bouncing baits type yeah. type of deal generally speaking yeah. Um, I can't have you on without asking this question. The yeah. musky. Yeah. <laughs> for we're probably gonna get into the love and the hate relationship, but um, mm-hmm. first off, do you ever guide for them, or is it just smallmouth? You know, m- primarily smallmouth. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, I see musky. We have musky bites, but you know, when you're fishing with smallmouth tackle, yeah. <laughs> generally, uh, when that musky bites, uh, you come back with a, uh, you know, <laughs> nothing on the end of your line. Well, and and that leads to the second question, which is the increase in the musky population has that changed how has that changed the river and specifically does it change the pattern of behavior with the smallmouth you know i i i think that there is some truth that it would change the pattern of uh smallmouth you know because i've fished some areas uh that i was like man you know they've got to be here Mm -hmm. and i mean i could just imagine that wood pile sitting up against that bank you know and you know what's in that wood pile you know it's probably some big long musky you know and we've got some big ones in the shenandoah yeah um just this past winter they chalked up two i think that were like 52 yeah. inches down on the south oh, fork yeah. lord yeah That's monsters insane. and so so uh i don't guide for for musky um but uh they're in there and uh, i'm sure that they you know, the, the big question is, you know, that's some people have a love hate relationship yeah. with the muskie, you know, because they think, you know, it's, you know, they're eating the small mouth, uh, and, and, you know, very well. I mean, they, they would, you know, whatever's, um, you know, prime, you know, I mean, same has been said of the catfish too. Yes. Though, you know, you're seeing just huge and that, of catfish. I mean, just, just yeah. Huge. And that's part of the problem. Catfish on the upper Potomac mm-hmm. is that they, somebody has, released flathead catfish mm-hmm. and um you know i know they're a, eating mature oh yeah yes I mean, and flatheads prefer live bait versus yeah. you know a chunk of meat thrown out there and and, and we're going to just be a hot topic here so I, I fished up at lake champlain where i've seen pike smoke a smallmouth i've caught i yeah. i have no doubt that muskie will hit yeah, a smallmouth yeah, yeah. and that's why like you've been doing the river for so long just to think about for for better or worse because i think muskie are fun to fish with and all that but it's still mm-hmm. if you're a guide this does change you know if you introduce wolves and you're a deer hunter it changes how they act like yeah. if you've seen that kind of change because that's a big ass super predator to have in the shenandoah or the oh, upper yeah. potomac yeah um as, especially it doesn't take a lot of them to change things and so how do you effectively then refish if you have to ch- change it up that's yeah. interesting yeah yeah i you know yeah fortunately have have not really fallen into that you know where i'm seeing so many musky i mean i see them every now and again we, sometimes we get follows uh you know when you're smallmouth bass fishing uh you know you look down and you know there's one right there at the edge of the boat you know as the customer's pulling their you know uh swim bait up and out of the water and it's like whoa yeah you know look at that guy so uh but yeah as far as you know i have really not noticed it changing up anything so yeah yeah that's a good thing then yeah um yeah winter time then i guess this would be the last question i got on top of my head right now but you know with with the winter time um you hit a hole how long are you staying in that hole before you're you're moving on to the next one because when you're thinking of like a drift i'm thinking in the summertime i might go a little bit faster um to find that that good water dead water but in the winter time now you mm-hmm. kind of know that they need to be in these holes do, how long do you keep yeah. a, a customer in an area before we're like we got to bug out and get to the next one uh you know 
I mean, I've been known to fish some holes till the sun comes down. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I know they're in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, in the wintertime, I mean, it's like windows, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's no bite 30. Uh, other times, I mean, it's on like Donkey Kong. I mean, you know, as far as the fish, fish bites yeah, concerned, I mean, I've had winters, I've had, you know, sometimes I'll fish a hole, um, you know, spend a couple hours in it. Uh, and it depends on how big it is and how deep it is and what kind of structures down there. Yeah. Uh, you know, earlier we were talking, you know, you gotta have the, you know, gotta have those rocks, you know, for the smallmouth. you know, you start yeah. feeling that chunky bottom, you know, you're in the right area. Uh, and it might take, you know, two or three runs across that chunky bottom to come up with something. It might take, you know, 15 runs across that chunky bottom. So do you think that's contributed to, I've always felt there's feeding windows. Do you think there's a yeah. feeding, like they're there, they're just not eating and then for yeah. whatever reason. Yeah, yeah definitely yeah. feeding windows. Lunchtime or yeah, time. and you can't peg those down, you know, yeah. they're, they they're all over the place. I think that's the best way to explain it because we do know that. I mean, you know that yeah. you'll hit a rash of, you'll put three or four in the boat. Mm-hmm. And, you and all of a sudden it goes cold. And mm-hmm. nothing, and, yeah. I lied another question. Um, yeah. The moon, you hear about mm-hmm. that. What are your thoughts <laughs> on it? Like, I don't have a whole lot of faith in it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, there is some truth to it, but, uh, you know, I've had customers before and I've, I've tried it, you know, like the solar lunar calendars, you know, yeah. and the app, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay, you it's know, a it's a full moon now. It's a something. five fish day today, you know, yeah. and go yeah. out and get, you know, just about skunked. Uh, and then I've had other times where, you know, it's like, oh, you know, it's like a two fish day. So, you know, well, we're going to go out anyways and just have a phenomenal day. So, uh, but there is got to be, there is, so fish, smallmouth specifically, they will feed through out the, um, like night, you know, if it's a full moon night, mm. water's clear, they'll eat at night. Uh, and you'll find something in some certain times of the year, especially in the summertime, late summer, these smallmouth will, some of those big smallmouth will go up into those shallows and wait and feed. Is, um, is there, what do you look for to make the switch? Let's say, okay, it's time that they're making that switch to night feeding. Is mm-hmm. there something you're looking for specifically? Oh, just like that, full moon, that full moon. That full moon, you know, okay. because it stays lit. Okay. You know, uh, you know, as long as there's no clouds and stuff like that, you know, yeah, they'll feed through the night. Interesting. Yeah. Yep. I never thought about night fishing on the river before. Yeah. If you think about that for the lakes. Yeah, not... I've never. It's hard, it'd be hard, harder, but I mean. I'm it not, is. I was saying earlier, we always think of catfishing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But. Yeah. I mean, but whereas the with the smallmouth, yeah, with the smallmouth, you know, you're, you're not, uh, you know, you're not marinating your, uh, your bait, you know, you're, you want something that makes noise. Mm-hmm. You want something that, you know, makes a um, uh, vibration in the water uh something like that you know because you know smallmouth senses you know i mean at night they might not necessarily be able to like really focus in on it mm-hmm. uh but they can hear it and then you know eventually get up close enough to you know feel it and see it okay. and that's when they'll you know make their make their move what is your busiest time of year for guiding uh you know generally late april to uh mid-october okay. The year this year's extended a little bit with uh you know the warm fall that we've had you know we kind of went straight from summer into winter here recently but uh you know with the warmer temps uh you know those fish tended to you know linger a little bit in that transition area uh before heading to the deeper water flow rate last thing i mm-hmm. promise for people that don't know that, like, unless you fish like the TVA system where you have that current and, and talking about the flow rate, and I heard Ott Defoe talk about this once about he would constantly look when he won on Douglas about the flow rate. How do you learn? Is that just something where you show up and you can just sense it because you've been doing it for a while? Do you use an app? And then from there, once you learn, like, this is what a flow rate is, what do you look for and how does that affect the, the positioning yeah. of smallmouth? Yeah, so, uh, you know, like with the flow rate, uh, the best place to find that is uh, the NOAA website. Okay. Uh, and and they you can get gauges, you know, all over the place, you know. And when I use, like, fish main stem, actually, I'll use three different gauges. Really? Yeah, yeah, because you've got the North Fork and the South Fork, and then I use the Millville gauge, which is, like, way far downstream uh, and is driven a bit by the dam flow. Um, but I'll use all three of those and just kind of get a good round number, you know, to figure out, you know, what heights, 
or what flow rate we're at. Uh, so the faster the moving water, uh, if it comes up fast, uh, generally the fish are going to go and hold close to banks, hold in some of those dedicated areas uh, like eddies and, and things like that. So they're, um, the, the faster the current, the tighter they're going to be. The, the yeah, they have a structure. smaller strike, a, a smaller strike window if it's a faster yes. current. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, you generally when you got a faster current, what ends up happening is is you have more dirt in the river because it's due to rainfall. Um, you know, so the rain, you know, hits and washes sediment of the stream and then the water gets dirty. And, um, so that, you know, will play a definite factor of color clarity, uh, on success, uh, you know, when you go out fishing, uh, flow rate, you know, will definitely, you know, is another that, you know, will play on the success of it. So from a safety standpoint, if I'm, and I don't, could be completely wrong with this. Mm -hmm. If I'm looking at the map and I'm going to go out at watermelon park. Yeah. And the flow rate 20 miles ahead of me is asinine. It's crazy. But yeah. mine's okay. If I, I'm looking at this on a Friday, is it safe for me to go out the next day? Or is the idea like, depending on what the flow rate is up here, it's going to affect my area? And what would be if too it's up, dangerous? Yeah, if it's upstream, it's definitely going to, you know, and you're fishing downstream, of it, it's definitely going to affect you. Um, and, you know, you just got to, you know, like I would say if out on the Shenandoah, you know, two feet, three feet, you know, it's fine. Uh, but if you get up to like six or seven, mm -hmm. uh, which is not flood stage, uh, depending on what, what, you know, boat yeah. you're in, you know, uh, you know, it was, it would, you know, and it I, could definitely dictate. Yeah, I think it's probably, and I don't know what location I would use, but I would say generally it's probably about a two to three day from down to yeah. change. Yeah. Okay. The yeah. time you hit, I mean, you know, as far as a rain event down there, yeah. and you're seeing high levels down there. So yeah. you're one to three days, I think, and mm -hmm. then you're going to start to see it. And, and that's and I've I've know. rode like I've rode the bubble, <clears throat> you know, because it comes up. If you look at the gauge, it'll come up, and then and I've been in front of the bubble. I've been on the bubble, and I've been behind the bubble. And if I had a choice, <laughs> I'd rather be in front of the bubble. <laughs> then so would that be because like before the, the front hits, sort of speak for the fish? Yeah, like, before uh, that water level gets up. You okay. know, I mean, it it'll literally like. You know, because you get a graft on the on the you know with the gauges, and you'll see it. You know, kind of an uptick uh, on it, and you know, like all right, it's coming up. And so, like you know, that generally will kind of uh, uh, impart a a bit of a can impart a bit of a fishing frenzy. How and and I'm sorry, like so when I used to fish, I used to float the river a lot, and my mom would get paranoid when it was raining heavy that I was going to get caught in a flash flood and die, <laughs> right. because like that's how she thinks of a river. What yeah. is safe for your for you and your dad to go out with the rain and everything? What is like no this is, do flash floods happen on the Shenandoah? What does that mean? Or if it like if it's raining a little bit, you're not it's not going to just all of a sudden a wall of water yeah. is going to come down. Yeah, it really, it's dependent on on what's going on upstream uh you know as far as like i mean you, we generally don't have you know like a tidal wave of water mm -hmm. you know coming downstream um uh usually it's a bit of a you know like a gradual but i mean i have seen i've been out on the river before and seen the river come up a foot while i'm out wow. there okay so i mean if you're wade fishing i mean that would make definitely make a difference um uh, but you know it's yeah, and you, and you definitely, I mean, we're not we're not like the Susquehanna as far as flow rate. Yeah. But you can, even the Shenandoah, though, especially in some of those spots where the rapids, the problem is we're like low water bridges on the south and then the, the rocks, mm -hmm. you know, the, the that's the problem with Shenandoah. The rocks, the trees, the debris. Yeah. And that river's flowing. Yeah. You're flowing, you're moving with it, you're going on pretty good a cliff, and it doesn't take any time at all, depending on the, the raft, that's the advantage of the raft. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you, you're... But if you're in a canoe or kayak, you need to be very, very careful. Yes. Or even jet boats. These jet boats, yeah. I mean, these guys that are running them, they've, they've got some experience on the water. They mm -hmm. almost know. They almost run in their sleep because they yeah. know where every rock is. With And I would, to your point, too, for safety, if you're not familiar with it, you're not experienced. And that website he said, too, you could even do a general search of Mill, Shando River, Millville uh, gauge. Yeah. And it'll bring up. Yeah, and, the uh, Mill website. learn to, to know those numbers. And then mm -hmm. when you're on the water, correspond that to know um, what you've got because it, you know, it can it can get tricky and get yeah. quick. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And that's you got to be you know safety on the river, unlike a lake, you need to be safe anytime. But the mm -hmm. river, it's it can be a challenge. Yeah. And, and especially if you're not experienced. 
Yeah. You know, in, in those conditions. Yeah. What, what are flow rates? Uh, just generic numbers for people listening at home where it's like, this is too dangerous or if it's at this flow rate up here, I'm just not even going to go try to wade or launch my kayak down here because this is just no good. It, sure. Generic numbers. Yeah, yeah. That. So generic numbers, you know, usually I, I go not ne- not necessarily by, uh, you know, flow rate cubic feet per second. I go by uh, the level. The level, okay. Yeah, and feet. And uh, so, you know, safe, uh, safe stuff, you know, right around two feet, two and a half feet to okay. three, you know, is – is generally pretty safe in my opinion uh you know could be good for, for a good time floating down the river uh like i said if you get into like six or seven um uh, you know i don't know off the top of my head what that flow rate is but man, she's cooking yeah. she but, is yeah. cooking so, so. That, that's good to know though and then the yeah. biggest thing around here that people really don't understand is the water temperature and yeah air temperature. Yes. Oh, so, yeah like i know a lot of course my lot of my experience in summertime and i can tell you you know, tons of stories of, again, just getting sideways a little bit, hitting that rock, and next mm-hmm. year, man, just, you know, I mean, we've had some canoes, like, in half, like, yeah, you know, some fold. to be alive on some of them is where you like that, right. but, <laughs> unfortunately, it was in the summertime, you know, you swim, <laughs> right. and so, uh, but at any rate, yeah, there's definitely considerations, as we encourage people to get out on the river, yes. you know, definitely, even as a wader, too, yeah. I mean, growing up mm-hmm. wading, I can remember mm-hmm. do some, you know, and I grew up trout fishing, wading the river, and could swim so it never really had any concerns but the yeah. some of the undercurrents and the whole the holes and the ledges in that river yes you know, it can be and, and people drown every year yeah and, and so. i think the, the the country sense and and the reason i bring this up is because i have a lot of kids asking me where to fish where can i wait mm-hmm. i want to get a kayak and it's like but yeah. they're they're they don't have the country sense because they're not right. from here they're all transplants and so they mm-hmm. get to the river mm-hmm. and have the information like okay i need i need to have hard and fast rules to know like this is probably where it is dangerous right. and i need to think about that because when you're young yeah. you, you you're you like yeah that. you're not you don't think yeah, about that yeah. Yeah. Respect Mother Nature. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. the key, and he'll tell you the most that certainly of that water. Yes, the force of the water, and that's what if you come up and hit a stationary rock, and that water, and you're moving, and the force, the force on the upside is tremendous yes. amount of force, and so or dams too. That's yeah. another you know big thing is you get too close to dams, and yeah, that's where so, like that's where they're like whitewater kayakers yeah. get into trouble. You know, as they yeah. get pinned, and that force of that water just pushes them down, yeah. and you know, <laughs> can't you can only go so long without air. What are some of your best or worst uh, experiences guiding on the river? Um, clients, I tell you honestly, this past summer, uh, you know, I had some older older gentlemen in the boat, and uh, we were doing a multiple boat trip. Uh, so we had, I think it was four boats out, mm-hmm. and uh, the one guy, he was a little bit of a hard head, wouldn't listen to everything that I had, you know, instruction and stuff, and so, uh, uh, you know, I. Got short with him a couple times, uh, you know, but then at the end of the day, it, it really kind of humbled me was the fact that he came to me and uh, his parting words were, I just wanted to let you know how much it means to us old guys for you to get us out. Mm. So, I mean, I was I, I was like, man, I was like, you know, the hair, you know, yeah. stood up on the back of my neck, you know, you and mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, probably like the worst time was a uh, guy ran that whopper plopper hook into his finger and it came oh out through God. his fingernail. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, the old whopper <laughs> yes. Big yeah, it yes, it does. It does. You know and the it's, big one or the it was one? the 90 and yeah. <clears throat> it went in right there and came out right there in the middle of his fingernail. So that was a, a clip it and pull it out, bandage it up. And I, I got to give it to the guy. He mm-hmm. kept fishing. So. Afterwards, you know, listen to your traps too. I mean, it is cool if, if you want, and you do get out and fish on your own, but it's not a mm-hmm. you're definitely not a you know selfish fisherman from the mm-hmm. standpoint you're yeah. you're taking people out to enjoy you know the river and the fish, and, yeah, and the passion for yep. that and sharing in that and, and getting people out in that environment. So that's that's pretty cool, yeah, man. It's that. I get I get them all ages, you know, I mean, from eight years old to you know, you know, 99 year old guy, you know, yeah. so uh, and then you know, it's I get a lot of folks that, uh, you know, I've been fishing since they were little kids. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they don't have that Mickey Mouse, mm-hmm. you know, Zebco uh, mm-hmm. rod that, you know, they were fishing with. Now they've got this open faced, uh, you know, spinning rod and, uh, you know, you've got to teach them how to, how to, you know, cast it and mm-hmm. how to right. retrieve it and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. so, uh, you know, it, it's for you know, lack of a better, um, 
term, you know, like an ambassador to the yeah, sport, you know, I mean. So how does one that would be interested in a guide and service with you, how would they find you and how would they book a trip with you? Yeah, so I'm on, uh, uh, you know, I have a website, uh, uh, Kingfisher Guide Services, uh, at kfguideservices.com and wegofish.com, which is a little bit easier to remember. Uh, Facebook and Instagram as well, uh, both, you know, under Kingfisher Guide Services. And, um, you know, get my phone number, you know, send, shoot me an email, shoot, shoot me a text, uh, give me a call. Yeah, I'll get you on the books. I mean, kind of what would someone expect then for these trips, um, you know, if they once they booked with you and they're yeah. going to go fishing, kind of what is what is the expectation? What do they need to bring with them? And yeah, yeah. What can they expect? On yeah, so, with you? so as far as like what they could bring, um, you know, I always I have a whole list of things, you know, like, you know, wear shoes that you don't mind, you know, getting muddy or wet, you know. Mm -hmm. You know what kind of clothing to wear uh things like that bring some sunscreen hats mm -hmm. sunglasses so on and so forth and generally what they could expect you know on the trip is that uh, we meet at the takeout ramp load up i have a shuttle driver who meets us there we drive upstream get the boat loaded up drop the boat in everybody loads up into the boat and downstream we go mm -hmm. uh and then while we're out there because i do offer um drinks snacks lunch nice. as well uh I and then yeah yeah no no man it's usually you know usually like you know you know some subs you know oh, maybe man. some cold fried chicken oh, you know goodness. some True. fruit yeah no kidding <laughs> so uh but uh you know on some of the stretches what i'll end up doing especially in the summertime is because i mean i bring tables and chairs and we'll actually set up Dang, tables cool. and chairs and have a lunch. This is you know, five star. Yeah, <laughs> but, about the experience. Yeah, yeah, and well, so some anglers, you know, that they don't want the table and chairs. Mm -hmm. They want you to hand them a sandwich. They'll take mm -hmm. a couple bites off it and they'll keep fishing. Mm -hmm. Other folks, you know, they want to, you know, you know, hop out of a boat. You know, maybe mm -hmm. do a little exploring. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you know, do some fishing while I'm setting lunch up. Uh, I'll literally set. Uh, in the summer, in the heat of the summer, a table and chairs up right in the river. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's and, nice. And um, you know, we'll cool. we'll dine with our feet dangling in the river. Uh, you know, so. Well, you know, we stuff. are we are in a gray area too. I've yeah. always felt that. I mean, it's the Shando Valley. I mean, as a whole, she's beautiful. River, you get on that river, especially. Yeah. You know, we've done used to do a lot of floats on the the North Fork down where Tom's Brook. You know, and there's yeah. a lot of private land down there. There's yeah. I mean, you could float for eight hours not see a soul yeah you know, and it's uh and see deer and turkey and mm -hmm. bear i mean it's just you know yeah. all eagles I mean, yeah so, anyway no it's more than just fishing you know, yes it comes down to it. fishing catching fish is almost a bonus yeah a lot of, yeah a lot of like i said it's it's not about uh the rod being bent it's about time well spent amen so to you that can, sir. you can quote me on yes, that yes. I, I will <laughs> love it oh <sighs> Well, thank you, sir, so much mm -hmm. for having us. This has been great, and hopefully, yeah. we're gonna have you back on. And again, l link to everything. All of his information will be in the episode description as well as on the YouTube video, so we can reach out to this man, book him. He is awesome. Highly recommend him. Absolutely. Great thank person. you. Thank, thank you. you again, sir. Yeah, it's a pleasure to Thanks be for on. Being Thanks. An ambassador to the yeah. 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 You really are. Thank you. And we're good. Thank you. All, All right. right. Thanks. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts Thomas Aaron's and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia.